Dr. Junaid Niazi is a board-certified internist and pediatrician who works as a primary care physician for a large healthcare organization in the Upper Midwest by day. And by night, he's known as Prosperous Life MD. He's a physician life coach, and he blogs and coaches physicians on all things wellness, productivity, finances, and careers. He also has a group coaching program to help physicians complete their charting at work, and that's why he's on the show today. His interest in charting also landed him as an information services medical director, where he optimizes the EHR for physician use and patient care. He's going to help you conquer your charts and go to home on time. How? By standing over you and forcing you to finish the chart before moving on to the next patient. How? By convincing you that whatever you can do with the extra time is going to be more rewarding than whatever it is that you're doing to waste time instead of finishing your charts. Are my kids more fun than scrolling on Twitter? It's what I do to mess around. Usually. What's your reward? Finish your charts. We also talk about Parkinson's law and why it isn't some forgotten formula from physics class or your neurology rotation and how realizing its truth will help you get stuff done. He's also anti-to-do list. How is that possible? So we talk about why to-do lists are the devil and make you feel like garbage and ultimately less productive. Dr. Niazi completed his undergrad studies at Rice University, medical school at Baylor College of Medicine, and residency at the University of Minnesota. He's married to a pediatrician and has two lovely, rambunctious toddlers. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, let's talk about this week's sponsor, Deputy. In healthcare, there are smart pieces of technology that businesses can't live without. Deputy has become one of those essential platforms for more than 250,000 workplaces. It's helping medical practices schedule their staff more efficiently to meet peaks in patient demand. It makes it easy to adjust schedules when the unexpected happens, like staff calling out sick. You can use Deputy on any device, on the go. Within a few minutes of picking it up, you'll see why it has hundreds of glowing reviews from managers and staff alike. To find out more and try Deputy for free, go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. Dr. Junaid Niazi, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me on. Really excited to be here. So tell us your charting coaching origin story. How does one go from mild-mannered physician to a charting coach? I'll I'll talk about how I got got to charting a a little bit later, but just how I got on coaching in general first, if that's okay. Yeah, please. So I did everything that doctors always do. Went to, you know, got good grades, high school, college, et cetera. Went to med school, went to residency, got my first attending job. And I was like, hey, I've made it, right? This is it. But it just seemed like, despite this supposedly being it, it just wasn't right. Just seemed like there were parts of my life that weren't really working. And, you know, I slowly started to come around and realize that I was just sort of burning out working in uh, primary care medicine. A lot of that had to do with just the disillusionment with the system. And I had personally subscribed to the FIRE mentality, so that financial independence, retire early idea, which is, you know, you work hard, you earn a lot in a few for a few years, and then you, you pull the cord uh, to do whatever you want to do. And that didn't quite feel right. And it was creating a lot of uh, scarcity for me. So, you know, more than just not wanting to spend money, it was coming from a place of lacking rather than really being cognizant of acknowledging and and even being grateful for all that I do and that I do have. Sorry, could you expound on that a little bit or rather expand on that a little bit? What do you mean by like you were experiencing, you were just like paring down so much on your expenses that it just, it became a source of stress rather than a source of fulfillment? I wasn't even paring down that much on, on expenses. You know, we, my wife and I are both just naturally frugal we have a a, a good savings rate but it was more when you're approaching everything from this mentality of i just need to do this for you know five ten years whatever and then i'm I'm done i'm doing my time so to speak you're really approaching life from this place of, of of scarcity and that seeps out into the rest of your life 
you don't you really start taking for granted all the good things, all the good parts of your life. And I think that exacerbates burnout for a lot of physicians. I think that's why a lot of physicians feel even more trapped in medicine than they otherwise would just from the burnout that they're experiencing. Does that help clarify? It's almost like a paradox. Like you choose this fire lifestyle or, or rather you're trying to get into this fire lifestyle so that you don't need to work. And then you find out, hey, I can work just for the love of it. But in the meantime, you're hating it because you have to. It's like a mindset mindset shift that really just messes with you. You're running from something. Yeah. I think that's the problem. In, in life, if you find yourself running from things, that usually leads you nowhere. You need to be running towards something. And you hear this a lot when people retire, right? So a lot of older physicians, if they don't have something, quote unquote, to retire to, they either come back to medicine a year later or they sort of feel lost or, or dissatisfied with their post-career life. Or they just lurk around the doctor's lounge and watch Fox News and complain. <laughs> yeah, whatever floats their boat, exactly. <laughs> but those that like... There's some that, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to travel, I have everything planned out. They're retiring to something. And I think it's that same sort of mental shift that a lot of us need to have. And that's what I was lacking. I think I was one foot out the door with medicine. And that affects how you show up in everything, too. I was sort of grappling with these types of mindset things. And I don't think I was necessarily aware of them at the time. But I stumbled across the Life Coach School podcast, which is hosted by Brooke Castillo, who's a master life coach. And I really started to binge her content, right? So I'd always, to that point, thought coaching was very sort of woo-woo, fluffy sort of material. But she was presenting it in a very sort of sensical, straightforward fashion that incorporated psychology and neuroscience. So there was a sense of familiarity with that, just with, you know, my medical background. And she really promotes self-coaching. So actually we're learning a system to coach yourself. And I'd st I started dabbling in that, doing it more and more. And I started to see some changes in what I was thinking. I started recognizing patterns in my life that weren't serving me and, you know, including on work, money, parenting, you, you name it. And I started to become like more satisfied with where I was in this moment in all of those domains. And so it felt like a weight was lifting or, you know, curtains were opening, you know, whatever analogy you want to use. And when you start understanding through coaching that the results in your life are really driven by your thoughts and not necessarily the circumstances in your life, that is actually a very empowering realization because you, the nidus of control of your life then resides with you, not with those external circumstances. And I was really prior to that abdicating my autonomy to those circumstances, right? This is happening to me. That is happening to me versus now I'm like, hey, that, that's happening and I get to choose what I think about that and how I show up in regards to that. So the real, the next step really was I joined a physician group coaching program. If you're a male physician, this is actually tough because probably about 95, per, per, 95 plus percent of physician coaches out there are women, women physicians. And, you know, their niche is usually other women physicians. So it took me a couple of months to find a, a group coaching program. And then one of the women group coaching programs uh, decided to let me in, which was very generous of them and all the members involved. So uh, I did that for two months and sort of Having another physician who's trained as a life coach reflect back to me what I'm saying and show me what, what I'm thinking because the manifestation of our thoughts out loud as, as words is where people see what, what you're actually thinking and they can then tell you, hey, this is, these are, why are you thinking this? Or you can, they can show it to you and you can understand, oh, this is a pattern. Like I'm starting to see patterns of, of thought here. That just really accelerated the transformations for me and really just going through that process, I knew I wanted to go through a coaching school to learn skills for myself. And then also just for my, my fellow physicians, a lot of coaches are specialists and there's more and more primary care um, physician coaches coming up. But, you know, I really wanted to share coaching with primary care, especially. So I actually signed up for the next cohort at the Life Coach School run by Brooke Castillo, who I mentioned uh, earlier. Went through that six-month training, came out of that. I actually did some coaching with Dr. Jimmy Turner of The Physician Philosopher. He has a, a program and did my own one-on-one -on -one coaching with other physicians. And with working with through Jimmy's program, I realized I kept chiming in on group coaching calls about things related to clinic workflows and efficiencies and charting. So, so Jimmy actually challenged me and said, hey, do you want to just do a focus call on this for our group members? And I said, yeah, sure. And that's sort of where my niche came from. I did this focus call and people responded to it very well. One person the day after that call implemented some of the stuff we talked about in clinic and she got home for the first time in her life at 530 and was able, able to eat dinner with her family where prior to that she was staying in clinic till 9, 930. Wow, that's a dramatic difference. 
And so that's where I sort of stumbled across charting as a niche for coaching. I realized I was on to something and I said, hey, let me explore this further. And I actually went on to develop my own program and currently in my second cohort of physicians. So now, you know, I've helped dozens of physicians through my group program as well as uh, one on one. But you had a background in charting, right? Like through your hospital, right? You've been on committees or like you were able to incorporate another area of expertise and kind of mesh the two together. Certainly. So I always, you know, just entering primary care in this day and age obviously involves a lot of charting. My wife's a pediatrician too. And, you know, our first year out, we would be sitting on opposite ends of the couch every evening and many a weekend night just typing away at our keyboards. And this is before we had children. And I realized something's got to change. So I became very intentional examining my work day, you know, down to the every visit, seeing where am I spending my time? How can I make this better? How can I improve workflows? And there's a lot of navigation there, right? There's administrative burdens just from the organization you work for. You know, medical assistants in one organization can do X, Y, and Z, and another organization they're not allowed to. So there was a lot of navigating that. But part of that interest led me to a role within the organization where I'm a, what's called an information services medical director, one of uh, five on the ambulatory side. So, you know, we try to make our EHR as user friendly for end users, as well as just making it better for clinical care. And, you know, where we fit in is we try to take sort of all the clinical background and mesh that into the decision making for any tools that are rolling out. And, you know, I think we're all on the same page where we're really just trying to make charting a little bit less of a burden. And one of our mantras is, hey, if they're putting something new in, we got to try to take something else out. Maybe we're harnessing a little bit of that uh, CMS mentality for budget neutrality here. But does that always work? Because sometimes with like CMS requirements, they're not budget neutral. Like they always want to collect more information. So now you have to do this. Now you have to record that. Now you have to record this. So so are you able to to do that even though their requirements for data entry continue to increase? Yeah. So specifically for some of their, you know, for example, a Medicare wellness visit, there's new things coming in, quite a few new things coming in, in the last couple of months, and we can't stop those. But there are also other things that the EHR has designed itself to alert us to things, and a lot of that causes alert fatigue. A lot of it's not utilized. We actually ran some utilization reports and found, you know, over over an 18-month time period, 99% were ignored. So if they're ignored, they're clearly not serving any purpose. So we removed those ones that weren't serving any purpose at all, and you'd be surprised at how much stuff accumulates over time in an EHR, or maybe you're not surprised at all because you deal with all the data that accumulates in the EHR, but all the other stuff also accumulates all the alerts, all the prompts, everything. So yeah, if, you know, if we have to give in terms of if CMS says there's something that needs to be included, so we have to screen for substance use disorders. We also have to, uh, one of our local payers is making us screen for a urinary leakage. So okay, you got to do what they say that you got to do. That's specific. I know. So when you were, and this might be getting into the charting, but for yourself, what were some of the higher yield things that you noticed about yourself that helped you to become more efficient? Yeah. So two main things really drove my efficiency. The first one was learning to really type well during the visit while the patient was talking. And I actually, and this took a while, I learned and got have become very adept at writing down their last response, typing that while I'm asking a different question, which is like a brain teaser at first. Because you just, yeah. uh, you, you know, when I first tried to do it, I'd you know, misphrase or, or mix up the two things. But that's like second nature now where I can just type what sort of what they said as, uh, while I'm asking a new question. And that just took practice, honestly, and a lot of fumbling. But now it's very smooth. And the second one was making sure I did every chart, you know, closing it while the patient was there or right after the patient left before I went and saw the next patient. And that's paid off dividends. Even if you're running behind in clinic, your brain will offer up a thousand and one reasons why you can't do that. And, you know, all those reasons lead you to make a decision that will later impact you and keep you stuck at work late. You know, before I did any of this, I was getting to know the janitorial staff at our clinic really well. I had the lights turned out on me, all kinds of things. Now that I have kids and daycare is right next to my work, I'm the one responsible for picking them up. So, you know, I have to get out of there as fast as I can. And, you know, even in this year, COVID has been a little bit of an exception with getting called away to daycare, you know, early in the middle of the day. But accepting that, you know, maybe five days this year so far, I've, I've left charts after I've, uh, you know, I've had charts to do after I've left work. 
So um, at like five, you know, five or five thirty. How do you get yourself to do it though? So the way it works in my brain is not finishing my chart is like eating cake. I want to eat cake and it requires a certain amount of willpower to not eat that cake. So eventually that willpower is going to wear away and I will eat my cake. I will not do my chart. I will let it go and then it'll accumulate and then it tends to snowball, right? You give yourself permission to skip one chart, you rationalize that, and then it's just chart after chart. So how do you get yourself to really stick to that? Well, your analogy is is on point because charting, like most of these other things, it's you can say it's easy, but it's not simple, just like dieting. It's we yeah, all know just how do to it. do just these chart. things. Yes, fine. You, you easy, just yes. do it. Exactly. But the execution, the discipline, the not succumbing to those urges, like you described, that's the hard part. So, you know, what I, through coach, you know, I figured out the strategy stuff first. Um, and then I discovered coaching later. So a lot of the, the, you know, the story I took you through about coaching that all, that's all been the last, you know, eight, yeah, probably eight, 18, um, to 20 months. And that mindset aspect that I gained through coaching really made things sort of fit within a system that made a lot more sense for me and made it way more easy to teach people rather than just telling you, hey, do this thing. Why can't you do it? But basically, to your question, if I want to actually get home to eat that cake with my kid, I know I need to finish my notes and finish my charts. So I know I'm making the decision now to deal with a little bit of discomfort because there's all kinds of things clamoring for my attention and my time when I'm at work. Phone calls, messages, lab, radiology, my nurse, everything. So I know I need to just, my priority is taking care of my patients, getting my charts closed so I can get home and spend time with my family and, you know, run a coaching business. Even if I did not have these efficiencies in place, I would not be able to have a, a business, right? Like there'd be no time for that. I'd just be charting at all hours. So I developed the discipline because I knew decisions made at while I was seeing had impacts down the line later in the day. And I realized a little bit of discomfort, which is now not discomfort for me. I, after you get used to it, you get over the hump. Just like if you're feeling, if you decide I'm not going to eat after eight o'clock at night, first call, and you're somebody who usually has a snack before you go to bed, right? You're going to feel hungry for the first week or two. After you get over that discomfort, you won't feel it at all. It's similar to that. So now it's not even a thing. And even if I'm running behind, you know, our staff has been cut due to COVID. So a lot more, you know, in medicine, <laughs> stuff flows uphill to the physician, unfortunately. There's been a lot more on my plate to get done. So there are some days, especially if I'm on call and we've had, we have physicians who are out on extended leaves for, you know, one reason or another. So now when you're on call, there's a lot more to deal with. And there's some days where I'm running, you know, 30, 40 minutes behind. And that's unusual for me. But I know even if I'm running behind, all my prior work on it. You know, if I'm seeing patient number 15 of the day, my 14 other notes and charts are completely closed. Their meds are ordered. Referrals are in everything. I'm not worrying about any of that. I'm not juggling in my brain. Who had that murmur? Gosh, you know, did we repeat that blood pressure on that one patient before they left? Cause it was a little bit high. I'm not worrying about any of that. That's all taken care of. So I can focus on that patient. So even if I'm running late, I go in and see the patient. They know they have my undivided attention. I'm able to give that to them because I'm not distracted by all these. I describe them as barnacles that are just, you know, clutching onto your mental bandwidth. But when you do start running behind, don't you have that pull to stop finishing your charts? You get hungrier and that cake starts to look more delicious. I, I mean, I think initially, yeah, but, you know, I think now having built up that discipline, that doesn't happen as much. And I think about people who are successful at, at dieting, right? They're able to surf that urge. They're able to sit with that discomfort and realize one person's in the waiting room, the next one's already roomed. We build up that anxiety within ourselves. If you sit and recognize most patients don't mind waiting, you know, they probably spend a couple minutes in the waiting room. We try to move them as fast as possible just because of COVID, get them out of the waiting room. They don't mind spending 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a little bit longer in the waiting room. And as long as I can sit with that discomfort, I'm okay with that. That's yeah. sort of the discipline. Everyone has those patients that, that get upset with them for, for running late. And for whatever reason, I had prior to COVID, I had one patient who came like an hour early for her appointment. And after sitting in the exam room for 45 minutes, was just storming the hallways, livid that I hadn't come to see her. Her appointment time hadn't even started. It was still like 15 minutes before her appointment time. You know, people are going to people. I actually had a patient recently who who was upset 
about the wait time. It was last patient of the day. It happens. Yeah. You know, I apologize as I do. I said, but this is going to happen with me from time to time. If you want someone who's going to run up more on time than me, I can refer you to another doctor. I know this doctor tends to run more on time than me, which is great. Yeah. I don't have to deal with that anymore. You know, patients tend to self-select for maybe providers who yeah. practice a certain way or whose attitudes match. And that's that might be the right thing for that patient, right? Yeah. Maybe that's a better fit. So what about some other charting techniques, right? Like what about the importance of dictation, carry forward comments, templates, scribes, like some of the other tricks and tools and things like that? Are, are, is that part of your philosophy, your management style? All of these things are tools that you may or may not have in your arsenal. Some people don't have scribes available to them. We don't. You know, scribes, a lot of people think scribes are going to be that silver bullet that fix everything for them. But really, it depends on how you use your scribe, right? They can create a lot more work for you that all gets dropped at you at the end of the day, for example, when you need to get home. So then you're actually delaying closing your charts for 24 hours or, or whatever until you come back the next day. And that might not work for you, right? So they also require training if if everyone has a unique practice style, a unique clinic workflow, so that you have to train them to get them to work within your own workflow. And then they can be a relatively high turnover of scribes. But you can train a scribe and you can use them very efficiently. I still encourage people, and I've had actually good success with some of the physicians I've coached who have scribes, by getting them to, again, finish that visit right after they step out of the room and then finish that entire note and chart with the scribe. Because several reasons, right? A, everything's fresh in both of your guys' minds. B, you can give them direct feedback as you guys are going through the note and everything. Say, hey, you wrote it like this, like, no, this is what I meant. Or when I say this, you can give that direct feedback, which maybe if you're reviewing late at night, you're thinking, oh, I need to tell the scribe to do X, Y, or Z. And then the next day you've, you've forgotten already. So I helped one academic endocrinologist who, who has a scribe who had a backlog of 400 plus charts. And within eight weeks, which was actually the length of the program, she completed that entire backlog and her scribe and her MA. She actually got her MA on board with a lot of this stuff too. She could only see 12 patients a day prior to that. She was seeing 16 to 18 patients a day and finishing all her work because she was able to, she realized she, she had to work on herself and she had to work on her team, including her scribe and just charting as you go made the, was one of the pivotal things that made a big difference for them. Yeah. You mentioned the scribe being the silver bullet that, that solves everything. That's what I was going to rely on. Because I have this problem. I get behind. I don't do my charts. I don't walk in the room with the computer sometimes. And just because I, you know, it's easier for me to then just chat and build rapport without the computer as the barrier. So, all right, a lot of this may or may not be true or may just be me rationalizing. And then I do it at the end of the day and I screw around. I'll scroll on Twitter or whatever. So, but no, once I get that scribe, then none of that will happen. So what you're saying really speaks, I feel like, You've been watching me, and this oh, is how you've yeah. come up with your commentary. Well, so I'm sure this applies to a ton of our listeners. Well, you just have to make sure the the issues that were keeping you from getting your work done, you know, you actually are intentional in addressing them in working with the scribe, and that way you'll knock them out, hopefully. You mentioned a couple other things. Uh, dictation, a similar thing. So we have dictation available in my institution. I tried it for a while. It made my notes longer and less useful, frankly, because... I don't know why. I guess I felt compelled to talk in full sentences. So I actually stopped dictating because in my EHR, I can track the length of my notes and the length of my note went up about 30 to 40%. And the content I don't think was any better. So I said, I'm making my notes trimmer. And again, you know, I do most of my typing in the room. So it just didn't work for my workflow. I have some, you know, some physicians, especially surgeons really like dictating. And a lot of them have really good workflows for during the visit or immediately after the visit hammering out their dictation and, 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 and they're golden. So uh, dictation can work really well for charting as you go. You mentioned carrying forward comments. I assume you mean like copying forward your last note? Yeah, exactly. Or like using the previous physical exam. That sometimes is part of an EHR. No, I actually, I think that's great. The first thing I do after I copy forward a note though, is I go and put in, you know, we use Epic and we can use a little a wild card, meaning uh, something that just stands, it's like a placeholder where I can't sign the note or close the chart unless it's addressed. So I just put that in every section, you know, subjective, objective, assessment and plan, forcing me to actually review those sections, right? Because if you just, if my last note on the patient was a pre-op for an ampute, you know, an amputation or something, and then suddenly they're a limb, you know, they're down a limb and I'm saying, oh, you know, all the normal extremity exam. 
you know, it's that's poor form and, and and a poor showing on my part. So putting in those wild cards forces me to review. But I love copying forward notes because I just look at my last assessment and plan, update my HPI based on that, and I can set my agenda way better for the upcoming for the visit of that day. And especially with you know a lot of the the new ENM coding changes, where all the time on that day spent on the encounter counts towards the new time limits. A couple of minutes pre-charting, you know, can help take you to a level four, potentially even a level five, just depending on the nature of the visit and how much time you're spending. So I think uh, copying forward notes is a great way to amplify your, your pre-charting. Is there anything else that you want to mention about charting? Because I also, like, you had spoken about just efficiency in general, like life efficiency. So I want to get to that just, just a little bit. So is there anything else you want to mention about charting? You know, just a plug for something called Parkinson's Law. This is, a, this guy was a, he was a naval academy officer in the British Navy. And then he was a, a sort of a civil servant afterward. And he was one of those people that actually hated being a civil servant and just, you know, bashed it constantly and wrote satire about it. And he came up with this law, which basically was, he came up with several things. The funniest one was he actually created a very complex mathematical formula, which showed you that the amount of civil servants, if the number of civil servants goes up in a government, efficiency will drop. And he was very proud of his official formula. But the one, the law that's best, that's ascribed to him, that sort of is most useful is, says that basically work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So Think about your work day, right? So if you can confine all of your work between whatever your hours are, 7 to 5.30 or whatever, look at that as your time frame for getting work done. If you go home with the expectation that you're going to just do your charts after the kids go to bed or, or whatever, or you're going to wake up early to do your charting, you've now opened up the entire rest of your day to getting that work done, which is a big part of the reason you work so much slower when you're at home. People wonder, like, you know, one client I worked with, we, we calculated the time she spent on a chart and it was 48 minutes per chart when she was at home. What would probably take her five, maybe 10 minutes at work was taking her 48 minutes at home because subconsciously, you know, you're like, I have all this time. I can just stay up later. I can just wake up earlier. I've had one person who was in one of my trainings who basically said they were sleeping 45 minutes a night because they were staying up late to chart. They were waking up early to chart. And I mean, clearly, how long can you function on 45 minutes of sleep? Like I can't. So it sounds like there's a impending seizure there. Oh. <laughs> right. Badness will ensue. So I really encourage physicians find ways to constrain your work to work. Otherwise, it's going to eat up all the rest of your time. And that's your, you know, time is a, a non-renewable resource. It's our most valuable resource. You deserve to have a life outside of medicine. Find a way to constrain your work to your work. Yeah. It's like when I wrote papers in school, right? Like, you save it for the last minute and then you get super efficient when it's that last night. But if it if it, the deadline had been different, then you would have gotten it done sooner. You just have to give yourself that deadline and then you will be more efficient. Like those days that you need to pick up your kids from school mm -hmm. or daycare are the days that you're going to be super efficient about making sure that you get it all done if you say that I have to get it done. Because at least for me, it's harder to use my EHR from home. So I'm significantly more inefficient. So I really don't want to do it. So I don't leave until all is done, which, you know, she just started working part time again, but she's home at bedtime every night. So I don't have to be there. But like you yeah. had said, but the cake is not screwing around on Twitter instead of finishing my charts. The cake is bedtime with the kids. So exactly. it, you have to just change. You have to be that two marshmallow kid. Right. The one that that delayed gratification. You give them one marshmallow. Yep. Yeah. If you eat it now, you only get one. If you eat it later, I'll give you a second one. So you got to just change your perspective on what cake is. Why am I doing this? Change your your why a little bit. Absolutely. So, you know, you mentioned sort of productivity in general. And one of the things I'm a, a big fan of is showing people how their to do lists are actually one of the biggest problems to them getting stuff done in general. I don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't believe it because I wouldn't remember what I need to do without said list. Yeah. So a to-do list, you know, I say to-do lists have two functions. One of, them, one of them you just described, right? It's to do that brain dump, to capture all the tasks you need to get done and get them out of your working memory. That's one. Number two is sort of as a, a safety net to just make sure you don't miss any major or urgent tasks. 
Those are the really the two functions of a to-do list. You might notice I didn't state anywhere that the point of a to-do list is to actually get those things done, right? So that requires building a system around your to-do list, which most people don't do or or don't do effectively. You know, expecting your to-do list to help you get things done is grabbing a screwdriver to, to hammer in a nail. And and sure, you might flip the screwdriver around and try to uh, bash the nail in with the handle, but it's it's not the right tool for the job. Or it's like a vision board. This is where I want my life to be, and I'm just going to hope that it gets there. I would argue that to-do lists actually have a, a deleterious effect on people that rely on them because they bias you towards tackling the easy stuff, the quick tasks, which you get a quick win and you get a hit of dopamine every time you can check something off. I mean, that's why people go back and add things that they've done for the day already just to check them off, literally because their their brain wants that hit of dopamine. But that keeps you from making progress on the big goals that'll truly move you forward. And that makes you feel kind of like a failure at times. That's when people say, I'm I'm so busy, I'm so overwhelmed, I never make headway on any of these things, I can't keep up. You know, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. So why can some people get a lot of stuff done while others sort of languish just staring at their to-do list that keeps growing and growing? And, you know, sometimes we stare at the to- to-do list or sometimes we avoid it altogether by scrolling social media or eating that, that pint of ice cream on the couch watching Netflix, you know? So... To-do lists are fine as long as they're part of a a larger system. In fact, I'd argue they're the first step in the system, and that's capturing all the tasks that need to be done. But from there, they've outlived their use. You take take everything from your to-do list, and you need to get it on your calendar. If you do that, you've now committed to getting it done, and you've allocated sort of your time and attention to that task, which is the only way that that task is really going to get done. So this is called, this goes by many names. One is called time boxing because you're literally putting boxes on your, you know, your Google calendar of scheduling your time to do something. Some people call it calendaring. Just I've heard a lot of different terminology for it, but you're assigning everything a time and a place. Um, This plays into that Parkinson's law. You're constraining your time available to get something done. So you'll, as long as you then commit to honoring your calendar, which that again takes some discipline, you'll figure out how to get whatever done in that time, in that time you've assigned it. A huge source of stress in my life is when I've got, well, I've got to do these CMEs. I've got to do, you know, this course or that course for the hospital. I've got, and they start accumulating, but I haven't allocated time for them. And so it's there in my mind, bogging me down, source of stress. That stress comes out in other points in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where my wife asks me, what's wrong? And it's usually because so many of those things have accumulated that it's really starting to weigh me down. Whereas if I had put them on a calendar with a specific time and place, and even if I said, you know what, I can't do bedtime tonight because tonight I have to dedicate to, you know, or X night, give her some advance so she knows I'm not going to be around. Now I'm more pleasant. Why? Because I've gotten it a, a time and a place for it and I have to get it done in the time that I've allocated for. I love it. I love it. Now I just have to execute on it. I have an accountability partner and it's for... Who's not your wife. Who's not my wife. Okay. It's another physician coach. And we just hop on a Zoom call and just to keep each other accountable. On the Zoom call, we're filling out our calendars and taking our to-do list, which, you know, I just use the notes app on my phone to capture what I need to do. And I just transfer it to, you know, I made a sort of just a planner-like page where I can track things and I do it on my iPad, which makes it super... um, easy to for me to track and then you know can put on google calendar as well if, if i need to but you know the important thing isn't actually necessarily finishing your task in that time that you allot it because that takes time to figure out how long things are going to take but what's actually really key is that you are honoring that commitment you made to work on that thing because like i said it, those folks who operate just off of a to, to-do list they may not think of it but they're sort of generating the subconscious narrative that they are a failure that that why are, why am i always running behind why like that weighs on people that is a heaviness whereas if you can tell yourself hey i just said i was going to spend an hour working on x y or z and i i spent that whole time even if i didn't finish it like that's still a win so you're almost like building up your credibility with yourself so you start to then get that reward and that positive feedback which is a more sustaining kind of reward than that quick hit of dopamine from just crossing something off your list. And that's what makes these things sustainable for the long term. It sounds like exercise and dieting the way that you're describing it, right? Like that cookie is that quick hit of dopamine, but the exercise is the more fulfilling and more sustaining, but you can't just exercise once and then it just happens from there. 
It needs to be a commitment. An accountability partner helps. If you want to listen to one of my past episodes, you can go to the episodes with BJ Fogg where he talks about tiny habits, incorporate some of those ideas. So, so I, yeah, but I love that, that it applies so, it applies so exactly to my life, which I'm sure is happening with 99% of the listeners right now. Yeah. And you know, that common thread between diet, exercise, charting, all of these things, that, that common thread is, is our mindset and how we approach these things. And th this is why coaching is powerful because you, and this is why, uh, you know, at, at the beginning when I said I was working, I was self-coaching on certain things and I had all these sort of ancillary benefits is because, right, if I fix this one thing with a fix, a, a pattern of thought that wasn't serving me, there'll often be all these downstream benefits that didn't even relate to you know, working on my burnout or working on scarcity and things like that. It's because I'm working on my mindset. And again, that has such diffuse and prolific benefits that it's it's not like a one to one. So that the common thread through all of this is mindset. And that's why, again, that's why coaching is, is so powerful. Are you still part of the fire movement? I think I subscribe to that financial independence because that helps give you autonomy and you know, if at some point the decisions at work are made that completely run counter to the other priorities I have in life, if you've hit a certain number where you're comfortable saying, you know what, you've, I, I set a boundary, you have now crossed that boundary, I will now take the, the action that I said I was going to take. So yeah, you know, I used to be like, oh gosh, we have to stay at work until, you know, loans are paid off or we've qualified for public service loan forgiveness or this, that, and the other. And, you know, in, in the midst of, of COVID, we did, we were unsure if my wife was if her job was still going to exist, her clinic was really struggling. So unusually calm during all that. I'm like, that's fine. You know, we'll be fine. We'll figure stuff out. We'll be fine. Whereas I think a year prior, I would have been like running around with my like hair on fire, what little hair I have on fire and, you know, contributing more to the stress in the family. But I think I was able to make it less of a stressful issue, even for my wife, just based on how I was reacting. So where can people find you? You have a charting course coming up and you also have a blog. So tell us, where can people find you? Where can people find the course in the blog? I run an online course uh, with group coaching called Charting Conquered. It'll, second cohort is running currently. It'll next be available uh, early 2022. It is CME eligible. So that is a, a nice perk for folks who need help with charting. And you can use your, your organization's uh, CME to help uh, defray the costs. You know, in that program, I'll, I'll help you finish your work at work so you can reclaim your time, try to make medicine work around your life instead of the other way around. And if you want to get on the wait list for that, uh, you can go to www chartingconquered.com and click on the join waitlist button. My main website uh, is Prosperous Life MD, and that's where I house my blog, my, sort of my one-on-one -on -one code, and you can just go to www.prosperouslifemd.com uh, and you can find a lot of posts that pertain to the material we've discussed today. Junaid Niazi, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me on as a guest. It's been a lot of fun. What a great show with Junaid Niazi, Prosperous Life MD. But before we end, here's a quick reminder. If you want to boost efficiency across your practice and make staff scheduling easier, try the Deputy app. You can try this smart technology for free by going to drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash deputy. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.